morning, friends. So it has been a really busy couple weeks in my life as Kimberly and I have been moving and settling in and getting the house straight and all of that. And so I'm going to be really honest with you and tell you that I have completely lost track of what announcements there might possibly be of note. Do you know anything going on? I have one announcement, and that is, please join us for hospitality following worship, and it's in the Martin Room. Yay. Yay. You know that, uh, Michelle? Okay, and since neither one of you happen to be on camera or on microphone, um, I'm just going to kind of reiterate what, what you just said, which is Women's Society meeting next week after church, and a Women's Society painting party at the Giggling Pig. What kind of name is that? I, I, on February 16th. What day of the week is that, Pam? It's a Thursday. A Thursday yeah. night. Okay. Yes, and, and that's like art painting. You're not like painting their walls or anything. Okay, just checking. And just to finish up that announcement uh, Michelle made, the Women's Society meets the first Sunday of every It seemed to, yeah, but it's a very small. Can you straighten us out? Another announcement from yesterday at Dorothy Day. Uh, about 150 options numerous sandwiches and things um, and I don't, we I thank can't. everyone who prepared food, mm -hmm. um, went down to serve and uh, it was a good day so 150 plus hot meals at dorothy day sandwiches and thanks to everyone who helped yes anybody else with an announcement mm -hmm. oh we still need uh someone to sign up for hospitality for uh next sunday don't ask me the date because i've been very confused about the sundays in february for some reason <laughs> well the nice part about that is once you do get get it set yeah the sundays in march have the same numbers good <laughs> with that it's the fifth yes i think you're right uh, are you volunteering art Excuse me, was that a guess? Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for not volunteering. Thank you for calling this to our attention. That's what I mean to say. Um, anybody else? Joys, not joys or concerns. That's too, we're too early for that. Announcements, things going on, things not going on that we need to know about. I, I, okay, sounds like we're ready for some music. Please rise as you are able in body or in spirit and join us in our call to worship. Jesus taught, blessed are the poor in spirit. He said that the realm of God is theirs. We read that those who mourn are blessed. Jesus said, they will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. The merciful will obtain mercy. All who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. Jesus said, they will be filled. Blessed are the, are the pure in heart and the peacemakers. They are God's children and will see God. Those persecuted and falsely accused in the face of evil, we will rejoice. Oh, Sing God's praise. Yeah. 
Would you remain standing as we read our invocation as printed in your bulletin? Let the mountains hear our voices raised in prayer and praise, wise and holy God. We gather in this sacred place to honor and adore you. We come humbly claiming the cross of Jesus Christ as our sign. We give thanks that you lift up the weak and lowly, defy the world's foolishness, and invite us to share in life at its fullest and best as a disciples of Jesus. We want to accept your invitation. Will you please be seated? As we gather this week, as we always do, we reflect on our own lives. We look at the places we are most in need of change. We are most in need of forgiveness. We offer God our prayer, trusting in God's forgiving and healing grace. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess that we have accepted the world's wisdom as our guide. We have been impressed by the power of weapons and the importance of high positions. We measure worth by the number of possessions we command. We have been unkind in our speech and uncaring in our deeds. We have doubted the power of the cross to save. Turn us around, holy God, that we might be blessed. Amen. Friends, the good news, the gospel, is that we are people who dwell in God's grace who experience God's love, and who have felt for ourselves the power of God's forgiveness. Each day we are forgiven, we are made new, and we are restored to right relationships. And so I declare to you that we are indeed set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> As the adults take their seats, let me invite the children forward for our time together. <laughs> No, no, no way, just slowly. Come on up, Gabe. Yes. How you doing, sir? You can leave me hanging. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about what do you do when things don't go the way you hope? You ever have things that don't go the way you want? Every once in a while, you're hoping for one thing and, and then something else happens and sometimes it's kind of bad. You know, Jesus was telling all of his followers that they're blessed even when things don't go right. He said, blessed are those who, who are persecuted. That means that when people are, are causing you trouble, and that's something that's important to remember, because when we are going through hard times, sometimes we can feel like everything is going badly and then we're all alone. But what Jesus tells us is that even when things are going wrong, God is with us, and that we can still find some strength there. And so, Gabe, my hope for you, when you go through some tough times, 
is that you will know that God is with you, just the way your family is, loving you and caring for you and supporting you. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus' promise that we are blessed, even when things don't go our way. Help us to always be strong as we live our lives. Amen. Thank you for coming up and sitting with me, and you can go on to Sunday school. Our first reading this morning is from Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you, be and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for, trans for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are pre per persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, speak to us. Touch our hearts with your word. Strengthen us to live our lives. Amen. The scripture readings this morning are interesting because they, they set us up for one way of looking at things and then show us that there's actually a different way of doing it. This reading from Micah, where God is actually calling the, the people of Israel to court. It's a, it's a setting of a, a prosecutor asking the defendant, what have I done that you have treated me this way? It's an interesting image because we think of God as judge sometimes, but in this case, God is the one who's coming as plaintiff, coming to ask the people of Israel why they have treated God so badly, and then asking, have you forgotten all the things that I've done for you? Have you forgotten what happened in Shittim and in Gilgal? Have you forgotten the way that I supported you through times of trial? God's complaint 
isn't just that the people have stopped going to the temple and offering their sacrifices. In fact, God goes on to say, what do you think I want? A ram a year old? Rivers of oil and wine poured out as sacrifices to me? Because that's just what the people were doing. They'd been following all the rules of how you sacrifice in the temple. But God goes on to say, look, I don't want any of those things. Those things turn my stomach. I want three things, three simple things, that you do justice, that you love mercy, and that you walk humbly with your God. Judaism, of course, particularly temple-era Judaism, was very much focused on the bringing of sacrifice. It was very much focused on doing the right things, living a life that was as correct as you could make it. And the sacrifices that God speaks of when he is charging the people of Israel with neglect are things they were supposed to be doing bringing the oil, bringing the wine, bringing the bull for sacrifice. Yet God makes clear in this prosecution that those are the outward trappings, that what God really wants isn't what you might think. It's not the sacrifices that all of the other gods of the, the area expected. It was the sacrifice of the heart. It was the sacrifice of how the people should live, doing justice, making sure that those who were in need were cared for, that the widows and the orphans were fed and clothed and housed. Loving kindness, not just that the basic things would be taken care of, but that, that the love of the Spirit, the generosity of, of humanity, would be part of their life, not just checking a box and saying, oh, yes, I dropped my money in the offering plate, and walking humbly with God. You know, this is one of those problems that, that people have. doesn't matter what faith tradition we're from, doesn't matter where we live or when we live. Humility is so often a problem. Jesus, of course, tells the story of the people who are bringing their offerings in the temple. The, the rich one who brought the gift and made sure everybody knew it. The widow who brought her two small coins and quietly dropped them off. You remember the story how Jesus said, this one is the one who is given out of her poverty. She has given everything, and in that she's blessed. It's not how much we do, it's how we do it. I was commenting the other day that at one point I served a church where, oh, let's just say many of the members were well healed, better healed than any of us here. The, the kind of folks that when the church had a major building project, you could go to one person and say, oh, by the way, we need about $500,000 for it and they'd whip out their checkbook? Yeah, there are churches like that. There are people like that, even here in Fairfield County. Those people, though, despite their ability to give largely, give, give well, give, anyway, despite their ability to be abundant in their gifts, were also able to be humble in their gifts. And if, if I were to tell you which of those church members it was that wrote the checks, they would cringe. They would hide their faces. They would, they would probably send somebody after me. No, they, they gave because they loved their church, out of humility, but also out of their abundance. You may be thinking that this is a stewardship sermon. 
well, in a way, all sermons are stewardship sermons because they're all about how we live. But really, what I want to think about with you today isn't dollars and cents kind of stewardship. It's the stewardship of our lives. It's the stewardship of how we approach the things we do. As we do justice, as we love mercy, and as we walk humbly with our God. Jesus talked about that too in his Sermon on the Mount. When I got my first Bible as a child, my first real Bible, I had a bookmark that I stuck right at Matthew chapter 5 to read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, to keep going back to it, to read about all those people who are blessed. Except my first Bible was a King James Bible, and so it was blessed. Just in case you're curious, if you if you want to use that 1611 English lilt, you can say blessed, it's fine. But yeah, it's your choice. Read it the way you like it. But to read about how those who are poor in spirit were blessed, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. About how those who mourn are blessed, because they will be comforted. How the meek are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Even as a child, reading about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness being blessed gave me a little bit of a head scratch. I hadn't really encountered injustice yet. But that notion of being filled with justice, I rather liked. Reading about those pure in heart being blessed, that's kind of nice. Don't we all want to be pure in heart? Don't we all find that we're not? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God, Jesus says. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's interesting. Jesus has this whole list of blessed are the fill in the blank, as though he's talking about those people out there. And then he turns a corner when he says, and blessed are you. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, if I were to do a quick poll, any of you feel like volunteering to be persecuted? Just so you can be blessed? Nobody? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny because so often when I talk to other Christians, I hear about people who feel persecuted. I hear about people who feel persecuted because they're not allowed to, to you know, gather with the football team and pray on the 50-yard line, except apparently now, according to the Supreme Court, we can, and that, that's a head-scratcher. I hear people who feel persecuted because their brand of Christianity isn't forced to be everybody's brand. I hear people who feel persecuted because they're not in charge. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus isn't talking about people going around with a persecution complex. He's talking about people whose good works actually cause people to resist them. We see this from time to time, even in this land that some like to think of as a Christian nation, though it never has been. 
We see this when we stand up to work for justice and in, instead find powers arrayed against us. This is something that we have experienced even here in Danbury, as we have worked together to care for the poor, as we have organized at the Dorothy Day Hospitality House to try and make sure that those who are hungry have a safe place to come and be fed, to be warm and to be safe. Yet we find people who are working to close it down because, you know, it doesn't belong in our backyard. That kind of thing should be, well, somewhere else. It's hard to stand up for justice sometimes. It's hard to speak up for those who are powerless and don't have their own voice. It's hard to do what's right. And of course, the Dorothy Day example is only one. You can fill in others from your own life, I'm sure. We all remember that quip about how no good deed goes unpunished. But what Jesus tells us in this Sermon on the Mount is that when we do these things, when we mourn, we are comforted, not just by God's Spirit, but by all of those others who come together in community and mourn with us. When we seek what is right, when we build justice, we are blessed because we're filled. We're filled with the justice that rolls down like waters. We are filled with God's grace and strength. We are filled with justice that comes back to us. That when we are merciful, yep, you guessed it. The mercy that we put out into the world comes back to us. It's one of these things that, on the one hand, it seems so obvious, yet when we look around us, it's so lacking. You remember that, that teaching of Jesus that said, do unto others before they do unto you? No, that wasn't Jesus. No, the, the world gives us these twisted versions. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus gives us this, this sense of loving, loving kindness, of blessed generosity, of humility that rebuilds the world through its own action. It's the exact opposite of the standard wisdom of the day. It's not what you think. Friends, as we live our lives as Christians, as we bring into ourselves this message that we find from Jesus echoing from Micah, may we find that our living a counterintuitive, generous, loving, kind, justice-making, humble life is indeed the way, even if it's not the world's way. And as we live it, may we be blessed. Amen. Not, let us pray. It's so difficult to find our way in the world, O oh God. We see examples being set for us of people who are successful, who found that success by trampling on others. Yet you show us a different way. You call us to humility, to mercy, to justice, to service. You call us to a path where we may be persecuted. Help us walk that path. Help us find our way forward through your spirit. 
We give you thanks, O Holy One, for journeying with us through life's challenges. We give you thanks for your presence as we face injustice. We give you thanks for your presence as we hunger and thirst for righteousness. For your presence as we share tears and as we dream of a better world. We thank you, O oh God, for your presence with those who are in need. We ask that you would be with Emily as she has surgery this week. We give you thanks for your presence with the, all of those who are ill. With John as he deals with health problems and with Wyman recovering from a stroke. We ask your blessing for Johnny as he recovers from his knee surgery and with Alicia as she goes through radiation treatment. Be with Alana, having tubes put in her ears on Wednesday, and with Michelle, facing arm surgery on Wednesday. We ask your presence with Gina and Janiel as they mourn the death of their father, that you would help them as they move forward. We ask your grace for Jean, having a surgery this week as well, and with Myrna and Irene, as they go through all of the challenges associated with aging. You are indeed present in each of these situations, bringing healing and wholeness. And for that, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, too, for the other ways that you have shown your presence among us. For Heather and Matt supporting Emily and her needs. We ask your blessing for Eloise and Audrey with their new lives, and we ask that you'd be with all of their family as they celebrate this blessing. We give you thanks for your comfort as we go through our times of challenge. And we give you thanks that you know our needs, that you love us, that you care for us, that you are present with us, no matter what we're going through. We give you thanks that you are closer to us than breath itself. And so we trust you to know what we need, even when we offer you our most intimate prayers in silence. Hear then those ones that we pour out in the quiet of this moment. All of these things, O oh God, we offer to you. All of these things we give you, our needs, our hopes, our fears. We give them to you, trusting you to hear and to respond. We give them to you as your children who delight to pray, even as our brother Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, 
Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us praise. Among the first Christians, there were no needy people because those who were rich brought their resources to be shared. They gave up their advantages so the needs of all could be met. Out of the rich legacy they have passed on to us, we bring our tithes and author offerings in thanksgiving for all God's gifts. The morning offering will now be received. Devote ourselves to these tokens of our thankfulness for the realization of your reign among us, Holy God. We pray for purity of heart as we hunger and thirst for righteousness and as we seek to be peacemakers. We rejoice in this opportunity to share in the extension of your realm. Bless us and our offering, we pray in Jesus' name. I suppose it's a and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O saints of God, the kingdom of Israel. And strength to serve the needs of God. Rise up, O saints of God, the church for you doth be. In the honey flow to her toes, rise up and lead her breath. Lift I the cross of Christ, tread where Christ's feet have trod. One sister's blood is in the Saints who have risen up in thee, let us go forth into the world to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. And as we go, let us go forth in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God, and in the power and communion of the Holy Spirit, who is indeed with us now and always. Amen.